Hi. <laughs> Hello. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Doing well. I guess we'll give everyone another two minutes or so to join online and then I'll introduce you. <laughs> I'm nervous. This is the I'm first nervous. time that I've done anything like this. So okay, well. First time for everything. Exactly. Yeah. Let's uh we'll give people two more minutes. Uh, there's our second presenter connecting. Hi, Josie. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we're uh, running a little bit late. I'll be home in about uh, eight minutes. All right. All right. Well, this, if you want, I can save yours till the end. You want me to do that? Uh, no. I don't, like we'll be we'll be we'll be right there. I think. Okay. All right. That's fine. Well, no problem. You're supposed to go second anyway, so it should be fine. I'm just giving everybody another minute to join, and then we'll start. Oh, this is being recorded already. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jeff. All right, it looks like the crowd is starting to build. So let me start by mentioning one thing. Someone had asked last week about uh, the custom of washing your hands three times. And I had said that I wasn't aware of such a custom. Uh, I wanted to, um, we have a, I'm not sure if he's online, is it? Is our big Goldman, Joseph Goldman, is he online? Uh, I don't see him, but he uh, was on in this year last week and he pointed out that um, that actually the, the safer that I'm using, the Panini Halacha mentions it as a Kabbalistic custom based on the Arizal. So there apparently is a custom to wash your hand three times each, uh, not necessarily a Halachic one, but one with Kabbalistic origins. So I, I needed to add that before we start. So, um, uh, the questions that I had been sending out, um, the first two presenters are supposed to go this week. The first question I had sent out was um, was taken by Monty Bennett, who's going to tell us uh, what his research and what he feels about it. And uh, maybe we'll talk for a few minutes and then Josie Silverberg will present hers. So, And then after that, we'll give the share. So Monty, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everybody. So the, the question was, if somebody had cancer and had their larynx removed, is it possible for them to say a bracha in their head and have it qualify as a bracha? Or um, if the person uses an artificial voice machine, are the people present able to say amen, um, or do they need to see, say their own bracha? So um, in Isaiah 56.5, it says, for my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. And Leviticus 19.14 says, you shall not insult the deaf or place a stumbling block before the blind. According to an anonymous author on the website of the URJ's Religious Action Center, Jewish tradition teaches us of our obligation to ensure equal access for all people and to help facilitate the full participation of individuals with disabilities in religious and public life. We are taught, do not separate yourself from the community, which is Perkea vote 2-5. Accordingly, we must prevent anyone from being separated from the community against their will. Exodus chapter four, verses 10 and 11 says, but Moses said to the Lord, please, O Lord, I have never been a man of words, either in times past or now that you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, who gives man speech? Who makes him deaf, dumb or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In the Shulchan 
Or Chaim 185, 1 through 4, we read, The blessing of food was said in every language. He should say to his ears what he puts out with his lips, and if he did not sound to his ears, he came out as long as he puts out with his lips. There are those who say that the householder with the sons and wife should greet aloud so that they may go out in his blessing. Even if one got significantly drunk to the point that the person is unable to properly speak, one is still able to bless the Burkhat Hamazon. Per Keavot 4.3, Ben Azai said, be quick in performing a minor commandment as in the case of a major one and flee from transgression. For one commandment leads to another commandment and one transgression leads to another transgression. For the reward for performing a commandment is another commandment, and the reward for committing a transgression is a transgression. He used to say, do not despise any man and do not discriminate against anything, for there is no man that has not his hour, and there is no thing that has not its place. Because of these quotes, I make the argument that a person who has recovered from cancer and does not have a larynx is able to make a bracha on their own by thinking it if in private, and if they are in, in a group in public and say the bracha with an artificial electrolarynx, that the bracha is valid and does not need to be reset by anyone else present. The person without the larynx would suffer great embarrassment if others reset the bracha. Rambam taught that it is forbidden to embarrass a fellow Jew, especially in public. Even though one is not lashed for embarrassing another, it is a grave sin. Our sages said, anyone who publicly mortifies his companion has no portion in the world to come. Therefore, a person should be careful to not publicly embarrass a fellow Jew, whether of greater or lesser stature, one must not call another by an embarrassing name, nor relate a shameful matter in his presence. As written in Bava Metziah 58b, a disciple taught before Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak, anyone who publicly mortifies his companion is comparable to a shedder of blood. He replied, your statement is correct, for the red color of the face disappears and it becomes white. Rav Binyamin Zimmerman wrote a shir for the Kachitsky Versual Beit Midrash dealing with the topic of embarrassment where he states, in fact, the Talmud's analogy seems to be taken literally by at least one of the Rishonim. In two places, both in his commentary to Avot and in his Sharei Teshuva, Rabbeinu Yonah explains that embarrassing another is publicly is a subcategory of bloodshed and is to be treated like homicide just as one would have to forfeit one's own life rather than kill another human being, so too must one be willing to die rather than embarrass another. So it is my stance that when a person is alone and, and is not able to voice a bracha, that the silent thought constitutes a valid expression of the bracha, and if a person who is not able to speak and must use a mechanical aid offers a bracha in public, that the bracha is indeed valid and all present can say amen because Rahman Ali Beg, God wants only the heart. All right, thank you. Does anybody have questions for either Monty or me? I have a question. How about okay. on Shabbos or on Yom Toivim where, where you're not allowed to use electronic devices? Is that uh, would he modify the answer to um, exclude those occasions or, or, or what? Um, that's a very good question. To be honest, I have not researched that. Off the top of my head, I would probably compare it to how we often allow uh, a disabled person to use an electronic uh, chair. But I I'd have to look into that a little more. It's a good question. Uh, that's how I would think too that it's it kind of goes beyond because if you can use an electric wheelchair i think in it, being able to talk i don't know i mean people use you use um battery powered hearing aids and stuff on shabbos so yeah i i, I that's my initial thought but i'm not gonna give it an official sock until i think about it a little more but that's a good question 
Um, uh, I wanted to um, just mention a few things. The uh, first of all, thank you very much for doing the research and set a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, and uh, the uh, the idea that that a person should think the blessing um, when they're sick and can't speak is is an idea that came up in the post game over the centuries. You know. Uh, and 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 all, most of the post can agree with what Monty said. That is, um, that is, they should think the bracha and the logic behind it. Well, there's two schools of thought. One school is that um, because the Rambam we mentioned holds that here are kadibur dami. We mentioned this a few a couple of weeks ago that the Rambam holds that thought is equivalent to speech. Even though m most of the Rishonim argue on the Rambam, in this case we can rely on that minority opinion so that this person can make the blessing. So that was, uh, uh, so as far as that goes, um, you know, I think most of the post that I saw would agree with Monty that the blessing is completely okay. Now in terms of the voice uh, box, the, whatever I did see was relate, mostly relate to comparing it to speaking through a microphone or speaking through a, a, um, a uh, you know, speaking on making a bracha on Zoom or something like that. So, uh, pretty much everyone agrees that you're allowed to say amen. It's not considered a, just a random, uh, you know, we're not supposed to just randomly say amen, but, but er, whether or not the person is Yotze is, is, is a highly debatable subject. I, I think a voice box might be, uh, so there are some that permit doing it through microphones that are designed with certain technology. Um, I didn't see that many people bring up Monty's issue, which was the issue of embarrassment, which is really, really important. And um, so, uh, so, uh, you know, in terms of most of the, uh, the polls can say that, you know, it's, it's better not to, you say amen, but, but I, I, I like what Monty said, and uh, that's what the polls can say, and thank you very much, it was interesting. Uh, Josie, are you ready? Are you home yet? Or do you want me to wait I until am. later? I am. Ready, uh, all right, fire away. Okay, so my question was, uh, whether uh, if someone is uh, is taking is getting food from a egg tube, uh, whether they need to say a bracha for it. Um, so this uh, this idea can really be separate into two main groups, which is uh, like saying a bracha over the joy of eating, but also the sustenance we get. So if we take one away, will we still need to say a bracha? So there's a Gemara, there's a Gemara in um, Hulin, um that says that like if a person uh, eats uh, forbidden flesh, like raw meat or something like that, um, he would be uh, liable to lashes. But what if he eats half of half of a uh, like kazait, an olive, an olives amount, and then takes the other and eats it? He only had half the pleasure of the taste, but in the end, he had full sustenance. Uh, so is he liable to lashes? So that's a whole muscle get. Um, and so why I think that doesn't really say that one that uh, that the reason why I why I say that this doesn't prove that one shouldn't say a bracha is because uh, this is a negative commandment. Um, and it's for forbidden flesh, not a peg tube. So it's a positive commandment, uh, thanking Hashem versus a negative commandment, like getting lashes. Um, and so there's that part of it. And then, uh, and then, um, what about taking medicine? Like if you take a pill or something or like, uh, I don't know, some sort of Tylenol. Um, so the sages say, you shouldn't say a bracha. Um, so you're, so you might say, uh, well, then what about the peg tube? Um, like a little thing later. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, I, so the, so the sages say, would say no bracha. Um, and so you might ask, I, uh, what about, uh, like, would it would taking it from the tube be the same? <laughs> would taking it, taking the food from the tube be similar to medicine? 
Uh, but there's a big distinction between uh, taking medicine and taking food because medicine is to is to help with something and it's a supplement, while food is for actual sustenance. Um, and so there really isn't a pasuk for the bracha exactly. Um, but uh, but you could say v'achata v'savato v'rachta. Uh, so uh, that's being like satisfied with food in your stomach, not necessarily food from your mouth, the savata. Um, now, uh, we might take the lenient opinion uh, and say, um, if, I, if you might not say a bracha, as we learned a couple weeks ago, if you might not say a bracha, then like you don't have to. Um, or you might say that like Valhalta can only be from the mouth. But I'd say no, Valhalta is not necessarily from the mouth. It's just that you have to be satisfied, the Salvata. Um, so you can have the person say, you can have a person say a bracha for them, for the person with the with the tube. Uh, when when like if someone could drink water and say a bracha, and then they can have the food from the peg tube. Uh, what I would say is uh, one should say shakal at the beginning of the day or some sort of verse that expresses gratitude because really the point of it is to thank Hashem for the food that we're given and the fact that we're satisfied uh, and, and to show gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have comments or questions for Josie or me on that question? If not, I'll, I'm going to make a couple quick comments. First of all, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. And um, and the issue at the, the her approach of looking for trying to find precedent in the Talmud for for the question is is a good approach. And then trying to find a precedent and then showing that the precedent might not really be the perfect precedent. So in the end. Uh, the question, like she said, really boils down to whether or not you have to both eat and be satisfied, or is satisfaction enough to to obligate one in making a blessing? And uh, the question among the post kim today, most will say that you because it's a situation of doubt, don't make a blessing. But um, but I, I certainly buy what Josie said. Also, her her swara, her idea that that the main point is being satisfied by the food and this is this person's way of eating you know it says eat this is the way they eat so according to that then you would make a blessing so uh so the arguments can go both ways but um you know i i, I it's, a, it's a really nice uh, presentation thank you very much i really appreciate it and uh next time the next two questions three and four will go and i'm going to put out a question right now and then we'll start with today's sheer and that question is we talked about washing last time. If someone wants to take the question, you can text me offline of um, washing your hands if you have a prosthetic hand, okay? If someone has a prosthetic hand. So now we're gonna go on to today's topic, which is the blessing of Hamotzi. I, I did send out my notes a while ago on Hamotzi. So um, I'm gonna begin by, uh, uh, you know, by, if you look, if you follow along with my notes, uh, it would be chapter three, part one. So the blessing of Amotzi is any bread that's made out of any of the five species of grain. That is um, how Chazal, how the rabbis interpreted uh, what the, defines bread. And the five species of grain, you know, uh, wheat, barley, rye, oats, felt is the famous, those are the famous five. So um, a couple of things is what, why is bread so special? Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, thought and philosophical thought about the idea about why is bread special, but we see in the Torah many times, I'm going to quote a little bit later on, some of the, a lot of the verses in the Torah and throughout the words of the Nevi'im refer to food as lechem. You know, lechem is just the quintessential food. One of the things about food that the Pnini Alacha points out, which is important for us to remember, is bread is like the quintessential primary food now, um, however, it's also something that's not natural. Obviously, bread does. We don't uh, harvest bread from the ground. We harvest wheat or 
with the grain and then human beings through our efforts make bread. And this is what really differentiates between, according to Chazal, between a human being and, and the animal kingdom, where the animal kingdom eats natural food and so do we, but our primary food is something that we work for and, and make. And it's very possible and we find in Tanakh that if we all have too much food and we, uh, we're proud of what we produce on our own, whether we're referring to food or, or our wealth, then uh, we could take pride in that, you know, and think that we're great. Uh, that makes us really super special, better than the rest of the world, better than all the other animals, better than other people, and better than God. That's a problem, you know, and, and so by making a blessing of Amosi, we're recognizing that, uh, that no, that uh, we thank God. He's the one that gave us the wisdom to do it, the ability to do it, and so on. So there's a little bit of philosophy before we go into halacha. Uh, and because of, of the specialness of bread, um, we, uh, we, uh, we try to treat it with a certain amount of respect. So the Pinin and Alcha mentions certain, what is called hidurim, uh, holding the bread in your right hand when you make the blessing to think about these ideas um, that we just mentioned. Uh, holding it with 10 fingers is a, is a special custom. And I, I wrote in my notes because there's 10 mitzvot involved in making the bread. Uh, the mitzvah of when we plow our fields, we're not allowed to plow with different species of animals tied together. We can't plant different species of plants mixed together. We have to leave a corner for the poor. We're not allowed to muzzle our animals while they work in the field. We allow them to eat as they, as they work. Um, we have to bring bikurim. The first fruits have to be brought uh, to the, uh, as an offering to, to, the, to God. Teruma, we have to take a portion and give it to the priests. Master, we take a portion and give it to the um, the levy. Master Shani, we take a portion and bring it to Shalim. And Master Ani, we take a portion and give it to the poor. And of course, separating challah. So th these are the 10 mitzvot that are involved in making bread. So we represent that by holding it with 10 fingers. It's not really halacha, it's just a custom, but a pretty nice custom, something to remind us of the specialness. Uh, there are also laws making a blessing on bread made out of wheat before barley. Um, uh, making a blessing on, on a whole loaf rather than a broken piece. I mean, you, you, if, if you have a choice and a, a larger piece rather than a smaller piece. Um, everyone knows after the hamotzi, we're not allowed to speak until we eat. Um, the reason for this is simple. We know that when you make a blessing, um, you, it has to be obvious that the blessing is upon the bread that you're eating. I sometimes kind of wonder like, why is this so important? Um, and I, I kind of think that that emphasizing not interrupting between the blessing and the bread allows us to, rem to remember the blessing we just made when we eat. If there was a long break, then we would make a blessing and have all these lofty ideas in our mind. We'd go do something and then eat the bread and forget all the lofty ideas and think about, you know, just satiating our hunger. So doing it together and close together is important so that we remember those ideas even while we enjoy the food. Um, the, the idea about slicing the bread, the, the Chazal say that in those days, the bread wasn't necessarily evenly baked. They didn't have as good ovens as we have. Um, so, um, so they would look for the place that's baked the best to get the best slice first. So the Chazal made a, a rule that you should slice the bread first. Nowadays, um, I mean, if the bakery would make bread like that, we'd probably go to another bakery. Um, most of us get bread that's fully baked and our ovens do a much better job. So it really doesn't matter anymore. But the custom of doing a little slice still remains. But on Shabbat, we don't slice the whole thing because there's a special a special uh, mitzvah on Shabbos of having whole bread to represent the, the, the man. So, um, so, uh, so therefore, we just do a little slice that doesn't actually cut into the bread. That's the reason for that. Um, if you do make a, a, a break between the blessing and the eating, then you have to make the blessing again because it's not obvious that the blessing is on the food that you're eating. Um, there's also the rule, the idea that, that it's, all, it's better for one person to make a blessing and everyone say amen. It's considered an honor, as I'll consider it an honor whenever there's a, a larger group of people together as one, unified. So if you are several people around the table, one person at the table making the blessing for everyone makes the blessing more special because it unifies everybody together in one act. With the exception that if you have uh, 200 people at a big uh, synagogue function or a wedding and uh, waiting for everyone to sit down for one person to make the blessing 
could be a little bit hectic. So in those cases, the rabbis usually say maybe each person, each table by themselves, it's fine if one person wants to get up and say amotzi for everyone, it's beautiful, but but each person should probably make amotzi first on their own without creating a whole a whole thing. Another custom we're familiar with, a lot of people are familiar with is having salt. Um, Again, that's a custom that that originates in the days of the Talmud when the bread was generally just made just flour and water and 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 baked. Uh, didn't have a lot of flavor, so the Chachamim said that you have to have some salt so it tastes good. It makes it a much nicer experience. And they said you need to have salt with bread. Most of our challah today has all kinds of things in there, whether it's eggs or sugar or or um, our, our, and we put salt in the most recipes to begin with. So it's really not irrelevant anymore today to say that you have to have salt. And most of us can say there's no rule that it has to be done. But the custom has become so accepted that uh, pretty much everyone, uh, you know, a lot of people make sure to have salt or some other kind of dip, you know, some hummus or whatever your favorite dip might be would serve just as well to make it into a, uh, something more special. Um, other reasons that they give for salt that many people have heard is, is uh, because is to, because we, we, uh, feel that the table is supposed to represent the mizbeach and in, 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 that we had in the temple to remind us of that. So um, so salt was brought on, on every carbon, on every sacrifice. So that another reason that, but that's a custom, it's nice, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful idea, but it's not a law, uh, so to speak. And then there's other Kabbalistic reasons given, which I'm going to leave aside for now. Um, I did want to, uh, there's, there's a, uh, and uh, uh, we, we said that in Yechezkel 16, in, in, in the Sefer Yechezkel uh, 16, verse 18, um, uh, just to give an idea, because it will be a nice introduction to the idea that uh, that when you make a blessing on bread, it 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 makes it it goes for everything in the in the meal. Um, I'm just uh, scrolling back so I can read the verse to you. Um, uh, it, uh, it's not a very pleasant chapter in Yechazkel and Ezekiel, but, uh, but here God is telling the people, I gave you bread, I gave you food. And what God said is, and the bread that I have given to you, solet, flour, and oil, and honey, I have fed you. I gave it to you. Uh, um, and but then you took it and, and gave it away, you know, you used it for wrong purposes. God is criticizing the people, but the but that verse kind of drives home the point and the idea that um that the the prophet is speaking about bread and then he lists a whole bunch of different foods. But so in other words, the term lachmi, the term what we say hamotzi lacham, really doesn't only refer to bread, it refers to all kinds of food, all kinds of food that go along with the bread. So here we're going to enter a, um, uh, a, a the discussion of of what the um, so that's one example. There are other there are plenty other examples where the word lechem refers to all food. So the Chazal said, therefore, when we make hamotzi, it it that blessing is good and it works on all the food. Now the rabbis made a distinction between two different kinds of food that one eats in a meal. This distinction can get. A little bit shaky, so um, we're going to go through it, and then we're going to have to decide how we apply this. Uh, I'll probably throw out a few questions this week on this one, but but uh, let's just go through the basic idea. The basic idea is as follows: anything that's part of the meal that's eaten because you're satisfying yourself in order to eat a meal, that's your sustenance, so to speak, or haspia is the term Chazal used to satiate yourself. That it all goes under the category of the lechem and the blessing on the bread, the lechem uh, covers it. However, anything that you're eating for its own reason, you're eating it because you love, you, it's a dessert, like, like you would eat it otherwise without the meal because it tastes yummy and you like it, you're eating it. And there, the term is likinuach, which literally means to wipe up, but like the, to, to, for the, you know, to uh, taste the palate, to, for the flavor, but not because it's actually being eaten to satisfy yourself. And I understand wow. that these categories are, are not 100% easy to understand fully, but these other categories that they gave, you're supposed to make a blessing when you eat it during the meal. Now I'm gonna give you an, 
a good example of, of extremes. So you take a piece of bread uh, and, and then you have a, you know, a bowl of chicken soup. So obviously that you're eating it, that's part of your meal. You have a piece of chicken or, or whatever your main dish is, a, a salad, Those are, that's your main food. So clearly that goes in the category of food. However, we all know on Rosh Hashanah, for example, we have a custom to have apples and honey. And we all know we make a Bore Priya Eitz on that. Now, why do we make a Bore Priya Eitz if we just said Hamotzi? Well, the reason is because you're not eating that apple because of the meal. You're eating the apple because it's a custom to have an apple and honey on Rosh Hashanah. There's nothing to do. I mean, we eat it at the meal because it's nice. That, that's, that's when we're all sitting together and it's a beautiful time to do the custom. But the reason for the apple has nothing to do with the meal. The reason for the apple is because of, you know, it's a beautiful thing to do on Rosh Hashanah. That's an example of something that comes in the meal that's not in the meal. Another example is, is so that, so the Chazal say that if you have, uh, you know, let's say a, a fruit for dessert or, or ice cream or whatever pudding, whatever your dessert might be, that dessert is the definition of kinuach. You're eating it for the flavor, but not for the meal. So a dessert, you're supposed to make a blessing on. Now, um, so, so that's, that, that's the basic rule. Now, the problem is, is that nowadays our customs of eating are different than they were back then. And how, how and when do we apply this? So, um, so I think that you should, the, uh, you know, it's something that you really need to think on your own. Am I eating this because it's yummy, but you know, it's not part of the meal, then you should make a blessing. Am I eating this because it's part of my meal? Then it should be, you know, uh, covered by the hamotzi. And remember the principle, when in doubt, don't make a blessing. <laughs> so if you're not sure, you're okay if you don't make it, because if you don't know, then you shouldn't. I remember growing up at home, uh, my father used to make a blessing whenever we had fruit for dessert. But, um, but during the meal, I don't remember ever anyone making blessings, but maybe other people have different memories and, and different practices. But, and remember the rule that if you don't, if you don't know, don't, you know, just don't, don't make a blessing. Um, uh, benching uh, Birchat Amazon, we're going to talk about in much more detail later. But just FYI, it, benching covers everything, even this dessert. So no matter even the apples and honey, you don't have to make a separate and fashion. You, the benching covers everything that you ate prior to the benching. So then there's a few other things that, because of their own significance, um, might require a blessing during the meal. One is wine. Okay, that's clear. If you have wine during the meal. Wine has its special significance. Chazal said that because wine is a special thing. Therefore, wine, you make a blessing of Hagafen. Now, on most Shabbat meals, it doesn't matter because we already made Hagafen during Kiddush. But let's say you have a nice, you have a dinner on uh, Tuesday night and you don't make Kiddush beforehand and you bring out a nice bottle of wine and serve everybody some wine. Even though you made Hamotzi, you're supposed to make a blessing Hagafen on that wine when you drink it. That's, that's clear. The question is, what about other foods that might have some significance? And the most famous one is, if you want a good example of, you know, there's four Jews, there's five opinions, this is probably the best example of all. And that is, what if you have a mizonos, a cake for dessert, okay? So there's about as many opinions as there are people. So I, I listed a whole bunch of the opinions. So some say is, is that cake is kind of like bread. It's basically, so you, ba you made a mozi lachem, all right, it's a little bit different than bread, but it's, it's, it's a kind of bread. It was, it's not appropriate to make a mizonot in the middle of, of a meal. You've already made a mozi on the bread, that covers the cake. That's one school of thought. It's too similar to bread to make its own, uh, to make a, a blessing on it separately. Another one is that it depends. If you have a mizonot during the meal, you know, as a side dish, then it's part of the meal. If you have it as a dessert, then it's a dessert, in which case you make a mizono, just like you would if you had ice cream or, or a watermelon or whatever. The, that, so that's the second school of thought. A third school of thought says, I don't care when you eat it during the meal, think about why you're eating it. Are you eating it because it's cake and it's yummy and you like cake? Is it more like dessert? Or are you eating it because you're, you're hungry and you want to fill up your belly? And so then, of course, there's the opinion of those that go through all the other opinions and say, because you don't know, don't make a blessing. And some say, and the Panini Halacha says this, but I'm, here's a plug for my own approach to these things. He said, you know what? Don't eat cake during the meal. Just don't eat cake because it's too many problems. So I just want to say that I don't, I never buy that approach. You know, I, I don't think that's what Halacha was meant to do, to tell us to, to avoid eating cake. If you like cake, eat cake. 
at the top of the bracha, figure it out. And if you don't know, don't make a blessing. Those are the rules. If you, you know, I don't, I'm not a believer in the don't eat cake one. Maybe because I like cake. I don't know. <laughs> but um, so, so I had my own um, way of thinking of this. If you have a mizonot in the meal and you would look at it and consider it a side dish or to your main food. And the classic example of this, I think, is a matzo ball. A matzo ball is a clear mizono. I don't know anyone that makes a mizono on the matzo ball. If there's someone in this crowd that does, then please let me know. And I'll correct myself. I'd be more than happy to. But I think almost everyone would agree that the matzo ball is part of the meal, right? So that's a mizono that's part of the meal. I remember my grandmother used to make a, what she called potato nick, which was like a potato kugel, but it had a lot of flour in it. It was almost like a potato cake. And uh, presumably that, that was a mizono, but it was served as a side dish, or if you have kreplach in your soup, which is also a mizono. So th these are examples of clearly part of the meal. And you know, you're, feel free to disagree with me, but that's, I think that those are, but on the other hand, if you have a sufgani oat or something for dessert on Hanukkah or whenever, you know, or, 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 or something like that, um, well, that's different. I'm sorry. I, I'm making. Let me leave that sukkani yoda aside for a second. But but if you if you're having it for dessert, cake for dessert, and it's actually it's a chocolate cake, and you're having it for dessert, then you probably should make a blessing. But again, like I said, when in doubt, don't make a bracha. Sukkani yoda are different because they're fried, and fried are technically much, um, um, are, are 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 would definitely be covered by the 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 hamotzi because. They're, they're not like bread, but let, let, let me actually, I'd rather leave the subject of Sufkan Yod for later because I'm going to be talking about a very complex subject like a couple of weeks from now about what happens when you eat uh, things made out of grain, whether you make hamotzi on them or mazonot on them. So I, I probably should not have thrown that topic in. All right. So, so that kind of covers the issue of what bread covers during the meal. Now let's focus on another question. When you make the hamotzi in the beginning of the meal, it covers all the food that you eat. How long does that last? Does that last for the next three days, three hours, three minutes? How long does it last? So the bottom line is, then this is what you have to think. Is this part of the same meal or not? If it is, no matter how long it is, it doesn't matter. It's covered by the hamotzi. So even if you, if you started a meal and it's the longest meal in the world, you got involved in a huge discussion and they took out some tea and some crackers and it's like five hours later and everyone's still sitting around and eating and somebody brings out more food it's covered there's no question it doesn't matter how long it is on the other hand <clears throat> what kinds of things were would break up a meal so again here there's two extremes right number one is the example i gave you everyone's sitting around everyone's eating and it's taking hours and hours doesn't matter how long it is that's the one end of the, the spectrum the other end of the spectrum which is obvious is if somebody gets up and says, you know what, let's bench, I, you know, I want to go, whatever. And everyone says, sure, let's bench. And they give out the Mayim Machronim. And then, um, and then, uh, uh, and then someone even starts saying, and then all of a sudden, uh, someone remembers, oh, you know, there's this great uh, Google I just made and I forgot to serve it. I, it's such a shame that you really should try some, right? Well, now it's too late. It's fine. You can eat the Google, but but, but you have to make a new blessing on it because in your, you, act, you went ahead and did an act of ending a meal. So that's the other end of the spectrum. If that's done, it's fine. You don't have to, you can go ahead, make a blessing on the Google, eat it, and then you bench for everything. That's totally okay, but you have to make another blessing. The question is, what about in between? So there's a few things here that are like famous debates. Um, and that is, um, and that is, uh, Let's say you, everyone's sitting around the table and then someone says, oh, it's really beautiful. And you should go look and see the full moon is, is just so gorgeous. And everyone gets up and goes outside and everyone looks at the moon and then everyone comes back inside or there's some commotion outside and everyone runs to check it out. So there is, is a difference between the, the Rambam and many other poskim, which actually has a practical difference. The Sephardic poskim, all poskim, that once you leave the house, no matter, even though everyone intended on coming back in, you left the house, that's it. Come back, you got you to gotta start all over with blessings. And where the Ashkenazi Poskin generally disagreed with the Rambam and said that as long as everyone had in mind to come back, you don't have, you know, it doesn't matter. You can, you know, the people go out. Um, 
if um, a couple other cases that I'm going to throw out there, uh, for example, uh, if if some people went out, right? So, you know, if everyone's sitting around the table and one or two people leave for a few minutes to go see something, do something, whatever, th and they come back, that's still considered this, if they're all mitzvah together. So that's the same meal. So as long as there's someone still left at the table who's not interested in seeing the full moon, then even according to the Rambam, it would be okay. But but if everyone left, then the Rambam would say, and Svardim would say, you have to you have to you have to make a blessing again. Um, uh, I'm going to skip through some of the things I wrote in my notes because I think that I pretty much covered this the subject. But uh, this there's a question. There's also questions if you're at a big affair, and you think the meal is over. And then all of a sudden they announce we're bringing out this, this great dessert. So does thinking the meal is over mean the meal is over and you need to make another last? So this is a, also a big debate people discuss back and forth. In general, the rule is I, you know, that most say when in doubt, don't make another blessing. This is another place where the Panini Alacha and others say, maybe you should not eat the cake. But I say, no, eat the cake. I just don't make the blessing because that's the law. Um, another thing is, is if, if something if you're eating a meal and somebody shows up in the middle with food that was completely unexpected, you know, it's the Amazon comes and delivers a package of food that someone sent from out of town and you're totally not expecting that food, then that you would have to make another blessing on that food because it was something that you could not possibly have had in mind when you had, when you made a blessing on the bread before. So these are just a couple cases to give some ideas. Um, if you make a deliberate break in the meal, but you totally intend on continuing um, and you don't leave the house, like so people stop to make a minion for a mincha before the sun goes down or something like that, that's not considered a break in the meal and it's uh, you're allowed to continue. Um, there's another case that's important to remember um, and that is, is that uh, the idea of kviot makam. Everything that I said comes from the fact that everyone sits around the table to eat. But what if people are eating in a car or you're eating while you're traveling or while you're walking or whatever? So there, there's no kviyat makam. You never set a place for your food. So at that point, even the Rambam would agree that leaving the place doesn't mean anything because you never had a place to begin with. So if you leave the car and come back so or, or something like that, or if you make a blessing and you're eating while you're walking, then this whole principle doesn't apply. So uh, I did give the case, uh, if, if any of the, uh, by the Hasidim, they have a custom. So everyone, you know, families go home and they eat their Shabbat meal. And then they go to the Rebbe's house to finish the dish. And the Rebbe gives them a little bit of food and they sing and they hear Torah and then they bench. So for the Sephardim, it would be a problem. But I, I just wrote in my, <laughs> I just wanted to say that luckily most Hasidim are Ashkenazim. So it's okay, right? As long as they had in mind in the first place. You know, to go to the Rebbe's house after their food, it's fine. The Svardim would have said, no, nope, doesn't work. If you leave in the middle, leave the house, you got to make them. I mean, it's okay to do it again. You have to bench and then you have to go to the Rebbe's house and make a blessing again and then eat and then bench again. But um, uh, so that would be another thing. Um, now, so I was talking about things at the end and I'll end with one more, one more halacha that's important to remember. And that is, what if you're eating before a meal like you know you're going to go to a meal and you're going to sit down and wash and you're going to have a meal and uh, you see some really good food and in a half an hour you're going to eat so the post sometimes the, the post can generally advise uh, wait you know don't eat the whatever it is is that you like now wait they'll be making unnecessary blessings wait till you make a mosi and eat the food afterwards now um that's that's uh okay in certain cases, but one of the most famous cases, sometimes you go to a large reception, right? And they're serving food at the reception. Um, and, and then you sit down to the meal after the reception's over. So should you even eat at the reception? These, according to the rabbis that I just quoted, you shouldn't even eat at the reception. But the idea is, is that because there's a, a nice break between the reception and the washing, and that break, you know, some are stringent and say go out for a walk between, but it's really unnecessary. If you're talking to your friends and you know you're doing whatever you're doing, listening to somebody give a talk or watching a presentation on whatever the charity is that you're having a reception for, or whatever it is, if any kind of break that breaks between the reception and the bread 
should be fine. Um, uh, but it's another, uh, you know, subject of debate. But uh, you know, I, I'll fall out on the. In this case, you, so you make a blessing on the food you eat at the reception, whatever the appropriate blessing is, whether it's shakol or bori, my name is Onot, and then you talk to your friend about whatever. That's your break, and then you go ahead and wash and sit down. There shouldn't be a problem with that. Um, that would conclude my halachot uh, of hamotzi for now. There's a, there is good, we are going to get to the subject of mizonot later on. When we talk about making the blessing of mizonot, we are going to go into the complicated question of sometimes things that have a blessing mizonot really have a blessing hamotzi. This is a topic that people love to argue about, but I promise we'll get to it. But I'm going to, we'll cover it and I'll cover the Sufganiyot question and the pizza question and all, all of those questions uh, I'll, I'll, we're going to save for, it'll be a couple of weeks from now. We're, next week, we're going to talk about Birchat Mazon and we'll have two more presentations. Any questions on all the things that we, um, that I just talked about? Questions, comments, anything? Yes, so, so? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's Jeff. Uh, yes. If you, if, if you're at a meal and you, you do take a break and you have to then make another bracha before you bench. If you're eating bread again, do you also wash again or is the washing from before enough? If, if, if it's the kind of break that you would, that you would have to make a blessing again, yeah, you'd have to wash again. Yeah. And, and, uh, but, but remember that that's rare, you know, um, you know, it would have to be either according to the Ramam, if you left the house, or if everyone left the house to go see something outside uh, and no one stayed inside, then that would be the debate. The Ramam would say you have to make it for, for, in Ashken, for an Ashkenazi family that doesn't hold like the Rambam, even if everyone went outside to see what's going on or, or whatever happened and they came back in, they would, you would still not have to wash again. The only conceivable case is where you started benching. <laughs> or not started benching, you washed my machronim or you started singing Shira Malo. There's something that, you know, that actively was meal ending. And then you changed your mind and decided to eat again. Then this would be an issue and you'd have to wash again and make hamotzi again. What so, does a uh, rahab mean? That, 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 that thing you said we're going to study next week. What does that mean? But could you repeat that again? I'm sorry. What does that term means, the Hebrew term that you said, brahat muzon. The note? Yeah, brahat Bur No, brahat yeah. muzon. Brahat muzon. That's just, what does uh, that mean? that's the uh, uh, benching, grace after meals. That's the, okay. the blessings we make after, at the end of the meal. That's what sorry if there's ever a term that I use, stop me right away. I'm going to do my best to translate everything. And I apologize for that. That's what we're going to talk about next week. Yes, that's the next week's topic. And then my, 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 my other question was something you said. I wasn't going to ask it because I thought it seemed like a silly question and I didn't want to make myself seem silly. But, um, and I think I probably know the answer, but I'm not sure. Is it for really, when you were talking about cake, like don't eat the cake or eat the cake, you said right? you like cake, so you would eat the cake, whether it's yeah. it. Is it, is it written... Is it forbidden in Jewish law to eat cake? That was my question, but I thought it was not, but I wasn't I'm, sure. It seemed like silly, but I wasn't sure. So, I, 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 There's no prohibition against eating cake, although if, God forbid, you know, if someone has, you know, something like diabetes and they're endangering themselves, uh, then yeah. Okay. But other than a condition like that, no, there's nothing wrong. It's a mitzvah, okay. especially on Shabbat, to enjoy your food and cake is fine. So, All right, thanks. Sure. Yes. Couple of questions. Firstly, I um, I'm gluten free. It's a it's not a lifestyle choice. Um, mm -hmm. I have celiac, which means that uh, I, I it's actually very dangerous for me to ingest any gluten. Um, so typically, what we do to be able to do a um, a mozi on Shabbos is that we have some mixes that have a little bit of oats in it. They're, they're specially handled and they're sufficiently devoid of gluten that uh, my daughter and I can tolerate it. Um, and, um, but other than that, um, all our breads and cakes are, do not have any of the five grains. Lomazinot. 
right? So, yeah. right, and I, I know you're going to get to this next week, but I, you know, I was, uh, but it kind of ties together in the sense that um, uh, typically, you know, for example, I'll go to a kiddish and I can't say uh, I don't wash because right. I can't say emotsi because I don't have lechem. Right. Um, and because I didn't eat lechem, I also don't say birka. Right. Yeah, and you have to make a separate blessing on all, each food that you eat. Um, uh, and uh, in terms of if you if you make uh, at, when you're home, if the uh, the challah that you have or whatever bread you have that has oats in it, you do make hamotzi on because oats is, is is one of the five grains. But then if you were to have a dessert that had no grains in it, even if it's a cake, there's then you you would make a blessing on that. Uh, I typically sure. I typically right. do show a call. Yeah, well, yeah, and that would be fine. That's fine because it's not a mizun. But um, uh, but during the meal, whatever you eat is fine. We it was covered by the hamotzi because the oats is totally fine. Right, and I mean and as a it, bread. I mean, at, the, at this point, um, we're we're using up some of the shmura ut matzah. Is, uh, <laughs> is our is our shabbos challah. Does spelt have gluten? I, spelt I, is. In fact, there, there's even a discussion in Gemara. Uh, spelt is actually an ancient form of wheat. Um, and I can't remember where it is in Gemara where they actually uh, describe that. Uh, it's, it's, it's before the before wheat was domesticated. It's more of a wild wheat, but it is, it is glutinous. I see. Yeah, there's a lot of debate about what the exact identity of the five grains is. I'm not an expert in that. You can look online. There's a lot of articles about what the five grains really are. I said it the way, you know, I've always been taught was wheat, barley, rye, oats, felt. But I mean, there's, a, there's tons of arguments about that. Scholars debate it. Uh, that's, I'm not an expert in it, but it's an interesting topic. And especially for someone like you that's gluten free, it makes a real difference. <laughs> any, any, any other questions? I have a question. Uh, you, a I'm sorry, I, I have a question, but you can go first. Thank you. Um, yeah. a couple scenarios of, of when you're, um, switching places. So for example, if you're on an airplane and you fall asleep and then by the time you wake up, you're, you're getting off the airplane so, and you didn't have the opportunity or if it's Chavez and you're taking a nap or, or the, the family moves to the living room just to hang out. So there's these scenarios of sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional breaks. Um, sometimes you have the option of returning to your place where you ate and sometimes you don't like the airplane one. So what do you do like a fire drill in school? Let's say you're right. about eating in the middle of lunch. Yeah, those, that's, a, that's a, these are good questions. Uh, the, the, um, the airplane is, is, is clear. Uh, you don't have a key at Markham to begin with, just like in a car. So it's the same case. So that, that the halacha is clear. If you're on an airplane, um, you know, uh, and even if you got off the airplane and wanted to finish your meal in the airport or in the taxi on the way to wherever you're going, it would, you, you would not make another blessing because since you never had a, a place, a fixed place to begin with. Um, the question you had about a sleep is if it's, if, it's a, if it's a short nap or even if it's an unintentional, especially if it's an unintentional nap, then it's not considered a break in a meal. If it's a permanent, like you actually go to bed, you know, you say, I'm going to sleep. And then you woke up two hours later and everyone else is still eating and you want to rejoin them, you'd have to start again. And that would be the line. You know, it depends if it's a, if you're taking a, if you, if you sit down on the couch and you fall asleep over a book or a magazine and then you rejoin everyone, that's different. That's a temporary nap and it's not considered an interruption. Uh, so we'd have to go through each and every one of those cases, but that's the general, uh, the guideline, how to, how to, make a difference if, if everyone left for the fire drill that would be the classic issue all the Sparta kids would have to make a blessing again <laughs> and all the Ashkenazi kids <laughs> would not <laughs> that would be that would be the line the difference if everyone uh, left if some kid didn't hear the fire drill and stayed inside then no one has to uh sure yeah go ahead so it's true that you can't eat grain on Passover, right? Any food with grain, you can't eat that on Passover, right? That's that's true, unless it's matzah. That's yeah. what I thought. <laughs> so that right. means you can't so that means you can't eat cake on Passover, right? Right, unless it's made out of matzah, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? I have, or it's a, I have, or potato level. starch. What about? Oh, you mean on cake on, on Pesach? On Pesach, Pesach. I, you know, yeah. I, I stock up for the year. 
right. and cake during Pesach. Yeah. That, that's right. non-gebracht. Okay. I have, a, I have a question. Sure. Um, the, there's an item, uh, item I says, that, uh, begins with the process of benching, such as washing, mayim acharonim. Uh, yes. Can you, can you clarify, or can you describe what, I'm, I'm familiar with the process of washing before you eat. Right. But can you? Uh, yeah, so th th there is a custom, and we will get to this. Uh, I'll touch on it a little next week. It's a custom from the Talmud that uh, to wash the hands before you bench, and it's called mayim achronim, which means the, late, the later water. It's not a, a necessarily a rule, so some people don't do it nowadays. But in those days, they did it mostly because they were trying, they ate with their hands and, and they would get salt on their hands. And the salt, if they touched their eyes or something would be dangerous. So they rinsed their hands before they benched so that, um, so that you don't have the, that salt. There's other Kabbalistic reasons and holy reasons for it too. But so there is a custom and uh, so whether or not you have to do it or could do it or it's custom, we'll have to leave that discussion for when we talk about the specific topic of the washing at the end of the meal. However, it is clear, though, that if you do have that customer, if you do wash at the end of the meal, that that is an act of declaration that the meal is over. So you're saying this is the end because I'm doing that washing that I do at the end of feeding. So then everyone would agree that if you decide changed your mind afterwards deci and decided not to bench but to eat more you'd have to make a new blessing does that make sense yes, yes. thank you uh -huh. you'll, you'll describe that in more detail later what yeah we'll talk about the custom of my mahron and we'll, we'll talk about it and we know where it comes from and and whether or not you have to but in it's it's some people have the custom some people don't but uh -huh. if you did it would be the meal ending <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Yes. Um, when you do talk about that, can you add in, um, like when we've spent a lot of time on Chabad and when they do do the, that hand washing, they right. don't want the women to do it. So I'd like to know why. Because we, our hand is dirty too. Um, you don't have to answer it right now if you want to answer yeah. it when you're talking about yeah, it. Yeah, let's let's leave that for then. Yeah, uh, yeah if you could put that in there. Uh, think yeah, I mean it's it's not it's an it's an important it's a good topic and but it's it's we're going we're veering off topic from today. Okay. So it's a but it, but we'll, 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 if I don't get to it, then bother me, ask me again. Okay. <laughs> I promise we'll get to it. Any any other questions before we close up for the week? As a complete aside, my mother used to make potato neck as well. Oh, nice. Okay. I haven't had it in many years because my grandmother made it and yeah. some of my cousins probably have a recipe. I, I suspect yeah. I have my grandmother's recipe. I, it's, it's, I know it's made with yeast. Okay, well, let me know if you could send I'll it. see you. if I can dig <laughs> one out. Thank you. It was good. <laughs> and you don't have to make a blessing on it during the meal. So the hamotzi is fine. <laughs> All right. Thank have you. a great, wonderful evening. Everyone. I'll see you Thank next you. week. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Oh, she's. Hi, April. Hi, you're up. You're upright. <laughs>